conversation with. Hi everyone, I am Khurshi Droenta Nariman speaking on behalf of Art and Artisans, presenting another session of In Conversation With. It's my pleasure to introduce Adele Cloud today. Adele is an artist living and working near Bath. She studied art since 2011 and most recently has been qualified as a secondary school art teacher. And as of this November, I've been told she'll become a full-fledged teacher or September, <laughs> sorry. Uh, she's a mixed media artist using recycled or found objects. Her artwork is mostly made with recycled textiles that have usually come straight from her own wardrobe. She creates quirky characters and makes up stories about their backgrounds, where they come from, who their friends and family are, and where they live. What inspires her most is children's stories, and imagination is at the forefront of her practice. She continues working as a teacher and with young adults with disabilities. So hi Adele, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, you're welcome. And we usually just start with where you grew up and like how you really got into the art field and why you studied it. Yeah, so I grew up around Bath. Um, I always have, I've not really moved out of the area. Um, and I went to quite a few of the local schools. Um, so I did my studying all the way up to GCSEs um, at a school not too far away and then I moved to another school for my A-levels. Um, I really struggled with my A-levels actually um, and it wasn't probably the right thing I should have done at the time but when you leave school it's changed quite a bit now but at the time I left they didn't give you a lot of support and there wasn't a lot of direction and especially if you wanted to be doing something creative um, there wasn't a lot in it because they kind of want to just push you off and go and do something else. Um, but I did it anyway. I went and did my A-levels, um, but then I went to college afterwards and I studied art and design in Bath and it was fantastic. And that's really sort of where I found, like sort of found myself um, and just realized how much I enjoyed art and being creative and all the different mediums that they introduce you to because it, school you're quite limited to the things that they have available to them um, and so when I went to college it just opened up this whole world of different things that you can do um, and by the end of that went on university because college were really supportive um, and completely want to send you off and do something that you really enjoy doing so I went off to Cheltenham to do my undergrad um, so I have a BA in fine art um, and that was a really good experience as well because you get the whole uni life, you've left home and you're meeting loads of new people and these new people that you're meeting have exactly the same interests as you. So not only are you making friends, you're also making friends that completely understand sort of everything that you've gone through to get there because they've kind of done the same thing as well. Um, and then from undergrad I went on to do my master's at Wimbledon which again was amazing because you're meeting even more like-minded people meeting people from all sorts of different backgrounds because we're in London so there's even more sort of like of a big cultural kind of thing there and yeah it was great and then from that I did my PGC because I was like oh what am I going to do come the end of my master's and yeah everyone was saying to me that now I've done sort of all of that art education and I've been through it myself it's kind of gone back around full circle um, and everyone was telling me I'd be a brilliant teacher I'm like why didn't you go and do it and so I was like yeah okay sure that's that's what I'll go and do um and so then that's kind of that's where I am now is um is that the bachelor's and master's and your journey there has actually changed the way that you conduct your career currently or how which trajectory you've gone from because you said everybody said you'd make a brilliant teacher but did you like know that that's what you wanted to do in art school or was no it? no right no no that was never the plan I don't think there really ever was a plan it was just sort of do what you're doing at the minute and then see what happens um and that's that's still what I'm doing now uh because doing my 
PGC, although it was great, it was really quite rocky at times and quite up and down. Um, and so by the end of it, it was like, hi, I just need a break. <laughs> I just need to breathe for a minute. Um, and so when my job um, as a teaching assistant came up and I went for that, that really helped me build my confidence back up and realize why I did want to get into teaching and why everybody said I would be a good teacher. Because um, if you told me this time last year that I would be applying for a teaching post to start in September, I'd have gone, nah, no way, not gonna happen. But it happened. And so it's just taking taking each each step at a time, seeing, seeing what happens. And is there anybody that been like a formidable sort of role model to you? And it could be anyone. It doesn't need to be someone from art school or it could be someone you follow. It could be even a friend of yours, family member. Has there been any sort of person that's inspired you to go into what you've done and go into the arts and still stick on with it today? Um, I don't think so, really. Um, I'm the first person in my family to have a master's degree. Oh, oh wow. Um, so, like, there's a few of my cousins have got undergraduate degrees but no one's gone any further so I am the first one <laughs> with a master's which is quite nice um but no I don't think there's been necessarily role models it's just a good support system that sort of have, have really believed in what I've been doing seeing how much I actually enjoy doing it and then really pushing me to be like just go for it go and do it and see what's out there we were talking about how mostly in the introduction how you're a mixed media artist and how you work with different textures and materials. So could you tell us a little bit about that? How you incorporate different textures and materials into your sort of work? And if you've got any like examples around you that you'd like to show as well? If you've got yeah, uh, definitely. I've got, I've got badly stone boys sat down here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he... Um, this one came out of doing something for Pictoplasma. So at the moment, because lots of things are online um, because of lockdown, it's been a bit of a strange time for making art because it's kind of like, well, what are you making it for? Um, but lots of my stuff being made of textiles, um, I can sort of make it. And then as long as I'm making it purposefully, I can kind of then sell it on so it doesn't matter if I'm making it for an exhibition I can always chuck it on my Etsy afterwards and someone will probably pick it up um, but the importance of textiles and materials um, is, to, is to make it more of a sensory experience for people so I've got no problem with people touching my artwork at all and especially if you touch this guy like he's got so many different materials and him he's got his velvet, he's got fleecy bits, he's cushion, he's like uh, cotton and felt, and he's got tasselly hair, um, and he's really, he's squashy, and so he's got all different faces, um, and loads of my work is like that. How do you get your, where do you get your inspiration from, like for characters, what's your typical setup? Is it like you sketch them, or you've got a story in mind? or you just find the materials in front of you? Like, how does it, what's your process? Well, usually, I do a sketch. So it uh, depends what I'm making, because um, lots of things I have um, sort of paper patterns for that I've already drafted myself. And so if it's something recurring, so I've recently made a rabbit and I've made a couple other rabbits before. So I know exactly what that one's going to look like. Um, but when it's things like, people come to me and they want their dog made, um, then I have pictures of their dog or whatever the animal is. And then I'll do a sketch from that to sort of get, so I can map out what my pattern pieces will look like. And then in my garage, I've got just boxes and boxes and boxes of old clothes and old fabric. And so I just go through them and I'll see what I've got in there that I can make them with. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, and it's quite interesting um, as well when people come to me and their animals are sort of all one colour. I recently made um, a dog that was all black and 
I'm like, okay, how am I going to define all of these different features? Because otherwise it will just look like a, a blob of something. Um, and so finding different denims and sort of jersey cottons and faux fur and all of those kind of things really sort of not only make it more textural and more sensory, but they bring everything to life as well. But that's one nice thing. Like you said, since they bring themselves to life, could you tell us like a story behind one of your characters or just because you said storytelling plays a large part in your art practice? So how yeah. do you know that? Do you start from making the textures and everything and then move on to sort of visualizing them and giving them a story? Yeah, yeah. So um, depending on what I've made them from, um, always influences a little bit of the story. Um, so one of the sloths I made, he was pretty much all made of denim, different kinds of denim. Um, and so I made a pun about how he's all, he's really lazy and just sort of like chilling out on the sofa, maybe watching Netflix or something and making a pun about it being in his jeans because he's made of jeans. Um, or if I've made something and it's a really bright color um, or something that's made out of t-shirts, they usually quite enjoy going outside in the sunshine because it's t-shirt weather. So I kind of play a little bit on the things that they're made from. Um, so the story always comes last because I don't always know what I'm going to be making them from. Um, but then I do like to work quite closely with my clients. And if they, especially if it's a caricature of something, then I'll ask them to send me through something. Um, so then I've got a little bit more to work with if it's something specific but then sometimes I get people and they're like oh no I don't want to send anything through which is absolutely fine and then I just sort of go on their Instagram and have a look at their pets and see if I can pick out little things to make up a story with but I do try to keep it sort of based around the textiles that they're made from um, but everything that I make anyway when I send it to my clients I put a little label diagram on it so that they can see exactly where everything's come from and what they're made from. Yeah. And do you find that sort of storytelling pattern that you have useful in your classrooms for your students? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, so being a storyteller, I think, also gives, it gives you the confidence to stand up in front of people and be able to say whatever you want and say things with confidence as well. Um, and it gives you the ability to alter your voice. I do a lot of hand gesturing <laughs> when I'm talking um, and I'm quite animated. And I think that's the things that students really find engaging when you're talking to them um, is being able to sort of say things really loudly at one moment and really quietly at another and just and getting your facial expressions. And it's kind of like, a, it's a whole body thing um because you, you don't just stand there really still like a robot it is yeah it's a lot of movement and walking around and suddenly like you're behind a student and they don't know you're there and they're like oh didn't realize you're behind me and you're walking around somewhere else and so it does give you that sort of that just a little added extra um being in the classroom talking to students like that it's good fun so uh, getting on to something else, when did you start your patchwork plush and uh, could you tell us a little bit about it, like how it began and the journey so far and why it began? All this? Yeah, yeah. So um, patchwork plush started 2019 um, and really just sort of sprouted from nowhere. Um, I initially made a cactus for a student support office at one of the schools that I was at because they kept saying how they needed more things for the students and when the students come in they're usually quite anxious and they like to hold things um, or especially if they're just waiting for another student to finish talking and they've got a bit and they just need something sort of to fiddle with um, so I made them a cactus which I called the caring cactus. 
uh, and he came with, he had a little drawstring bag and in the drawstring bag, I just put lots of little inspirational quotes and things. Um, and I thought that was just quite a nice thing if the students need something to just to read, to take their mind off if they're having to sit and, and wait to see someone. Um, and they absolutely loved it. And they told me it was a really, really nice thing to do. And I was just, I was just doing it to sort of be helpful <laughs> so that they had something. But yeah, they absolutely loved it. And they told me the students use it all the time. Um, and it's just because it's got a little smiley face on it. And so it's just this happy little cactus that sits in, in their office. Um, and so that was really the first thing that I made. And then there was a special needs school that we went to on a placement and they were Nemo class. And so I made them a clownfish to say thank you because they were really supportive um, when I was in there uh, and helping them do sort of all the different activities and things. Um, so yeah, that was the cactus and then it was Nemo. And then I made something else for another school um, to say thank you for having me on placement. Um, and then one of the teachers asked me if I could make her some turtles for her daughter. And then because I'm putting all of this on Instagram as well, um, someone then contacted me and they wanted a rabbit. And so I was like, maybe I could actually do something with this. And it's quite good because obviously having collected all of my materials from doing various uni courses, got quite a lot of them. So it was like, well, this is great because now I can use up some of those materials as well. Um, and yeah, it's a really good sort of sensory experience for the children, um, especially the Nemo, all of his different stripes were a different fabric. Um, and so they loved touching him because then they could feel the different stripes and the shape of Nemo and understand it was a stripy fit. Um, and yeah, so then from there, and especially from the baby contact me on Instagram, I was just like, oh yeah, I'm gonna give this a go. And, Try and do something about it so that's how that started and it's still ongoing as well um so i've set up my etsy shop and people buy from that which is really lovely people contact me through instagram or facebook or my website um and yeah so it's just still still ongoing um at the minute and uh, what is the use of your recycling before? Was that a conscientious decision to use that because of the environment or is it just something that happened? Like, um, Just something that happened. Um, so during my undergrad um, and relying on student loans and you're too busy to be working and things, um, but obviously doing an art degree, you have to be making work of some kind. Um, and so I asked people just if they had anything. Um, and so it started off with one of the students on our course had just moved house. And so she'd taken loads of curtains um, out of the house and just other little bits and pieces um, that she'd found around. And so she said, oh, you can have them. So I was like, oh, wonderful. I've got loads of curtains that I can work with. Um, and then other people going, oh, I was going to go and take this to the charity shop because they're leaving their student house and they don't want to take everything home. So it's like, do you want this to make some work out of? I'm like, yeah, OK, I have that. That's lovely. Um, and then so it's just loads of people just going, oh, would you like this? Or do you need anything to make your work? Um, but then it was, I really liked that I am recycling and I am using secondhand materials. Um, and so that has now consciously become a part of my work, even though it wasn't initially. Initially, it was just, I don't have any money to buy any materials. So although it started from that, it is now a really important part of my work. Um, and that's why people come to me as well to make them um, commissions and things because they know I'm not going to go out and buy loads of things so that I can make what it is that they want. They're coming to me because it's made of recycled materials um, and which also means I can make things a little bit cheaper for people because I'm not buying any materials. It is just my 
manual labour for it, um, which is also lovely because then I've not got to worry about whether the haberdashery is open down the road um, because I've run out of whatever or the same with like maybe colour matching something. I don't need to worry about that because it's all patchwork, it's all recycled stuff and people understand that. So they know that their items, although I do check for imperfections and stains and everything, I try not to use things. Um, they know that I am going to give them something that doesn't necessarily look like it is recycled either, um, which is, is really lovely. Um, and I'm really lucky that I've got all of the people that come to me for those things. Yeah, absolutely. I think recycling is really hard to do very heavily just because of everything that's going on. So keep that up. That's really good. And other than that, I just wanted to ask you, because you said that you work with um, young adults who are disabled as well and who have had difficulties there. Um, have you found that, do you know, like you said, you made a cactus remember when you first started and it's just a grinning cactus and the kids use it and they love it. Yeah. Um, have you found that your work sort of relates to students like this or not really like how is the interaction between the toys that you make and um yeah so it really depends what i'm making um i made quite a few years ago a really big um sort of like fly type of insect beetle -y thing um which went off to a school um and they put it in sort of one of their more sensory classrooms and the kids love it and they wrap themselves up in his wing and his legs are huge he's i can't remember what dimensions he was but i know that his wingspan was about four meters so he was pretty big um and the kids that use him are tiny as well they're like primary kids so to, to them he must be even bigger um but yeah so they sort of snuggle up in his wings and they lie on his body and his legs and everything um and so i really like that he goes he's gone to that school and, and the kids use him um even though he started off as an artwork which we did put in an exhibition when i was at uni um and then there's been other things that i've done so i make quite a lot of cushions and bean bags um, and i've made a weighted blanket and i made a blanket that was filled with ball pit balls in it um, and recently I made a teepee for school as well. And the kids absolutely love it. And it's great as well because I work at the school. So I get to see them when they're using it. And sometimes I'm in their class. Um, and so just seeing them go and sit in the teepee and they're playing with whatever toys they've got or they're sat at their desk and they're sort of like stroking cushion that I've made for them or like we've used the weighted blanket on kids to help calm them down and things. And it's just really lovely to see that my things are being used. Because um, I know that sometimes you make things for schools and you don't get to see it necessarily being used. So it is really nice that I go in in the morning and there's one of the girls that's sat in the teepee and you can just see the smile on her face because she's just loving being surrounded by these bright colors and got a little bit of bunting that goes down the opening of it as well. Um, and so it's just, it's a really, really nice feeling to see that they are enjoying the things that I make for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what exactly is your goal also as an artist? Is it, is it this, basically? Seeing that some of your toys are actually helping, say, others, or just brightening up someone's day? Or... Yeah, I think that is exactly what it is. I think people make art for getting a reaction or they make art to have a comment about something that's going on um, and it is but it is always to get people's thoughts going like you're you're looking at a piece of work and I think even if you're feeling nothing then that's still a reaction um, and that is exactly what you make art for isn't it is to make a comment get a reaction out of someone. But I think lots of people have it in their heads that they think a reaction has to be some sort of really big impact. You've got to, I don't know, you're 
you're Mark Rothko and you want people to really sit and think about your painting. But making things and seeing a child being really happy is also a reaction. And I just think nothing, it doesn't always have to be that big dramatic thing on a wall. It can be a little bean bag, but it feels nice. And when you, you put it on your face and it's nice and soft and it makes a nice crunching noise and you can throw it and you can catch it and it's fun and you can interact with it. And the person is really happy. And I think that is a good enough reaction in itself. And yeah, I kind of think what is the point of making work if people can't react to it in the way that they want to? I mean, you'll always get people that will see things I make and they go, well, you know, that's not really art because that kid's climbing all over it or that person's sat on it and they're just moving it. But it's like, well, everybody has their own interpretation of what art is. And if that person's reaction is, mm, I don't get it, I don't think it's art, but these people are really enjoying it, then I think that's brilliant. And yeah, that's that's enough for me. Making people happy, making them smile is plenty enough for me. It basically sounds like you get your sort of happiness and inspiration from them almost, which is yeah. not wrong, not but the larger picture was sort of thing. So getting back to this only, what sort of keeps you going and motivated? Um, I think my friends mostly, my friends and family, um, the same as keeping going through all of the, the different degrees and the PGCE and everything like that. Um, and it's, it's the same with making art. Um, the amount of times that I message my friends and I'm just like, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm having a really bad week and no one's buying anything from my Etsy or I've just got no inspiration. And then they go, hang on a minute let's like just regroup have a think like look at how far you've come look at the things you make and look at how happy it makes people it's like yeah yeah you're having maybe a bad week but these are all the the good things that really outweigh it um and so I think just having that that support is fundamental I think to doing anything um, and, and keeping you going um, and I think as well like if you really really want something so to make artwork that makes people happy um, or just even like just having that kind of drive to to make stuff I know that if I'm not making anything if I've not made anything for a couple of weeks then it could be because of my own doing and just wanting to have a break because I've been so busy I'm quite miserable by the end of it. So it's like, even if I am having a break, I've always got a little like sketchbook that I'm just doing a little doodle in, whether it's just like something from my imagination or if I'm just copying something from the internet, like a Disney character or something, at least I am getting that creativity out because otherwise it stays in my brain and it stews. And yeah, I think we, we all know that feeling. So just haven't, haven't done anything for ages and now I'm really unhappy. Um, so yeah, even if I am having a break, I'm still doing something. I'm never really having a break. Um, so but my old uni lecturer um, used to have a saying about um, inspiration finding you working. And that's always stayed with me as well. So it's like even if I'm not making something actively, but I am still doing my doodles, then <clears throat> then it is still making me feel inspired to keep going um and I think that's sort of that's a really important thing as well is um is just to keep in mind what it is that you want to do um whether that is a massive exhibition or whether it is just working away in your studio just because you want to um I always think like life isn't a race either um you do things as and when it fits as and when you want to do it um, yeah and I think as long as you've got that support system around you and they're going 
yeah, absolutely. Like you're doing this now. Now I'm on my teaching pathway. But in a couple of years time, there might be an opportunity to go and do a residency somewhere that really appealing to me. So I'll go and do that. And I just think, yeah, just having, knowing what it is that you want to do. So I know that I am an artist. I'm living somewhere within the art world. And, but yeah, it's not a straight line of a path, is it? It, it goes all, all over the place and you just follow it wherever you want to. So the last, um, well, you've given a lot of advice right now, but what advice would you like to give, say, young aspiring artists who are either scared or afraid to get into the line or worried, basically, or just not knowing? Is there anything you'd like to say? Because you I think we both are, so it's nice. Yeah. To, yeah. I think just go for it. If it's something that you really, really want to do, then people will always be behind you because you'll either find like-minded people where you want to go, whether that's going to uni or going to college, you'll always find people that want to do the same thing as you. Um, and it is scary putting yourself out there um, and applying for exhibitions because the amount of exhibitions that you apply for and then the amount of exhi exhibitions you actually get into, they vary quite a lot. So it's, but then it's not always about actually getting into the exhibition. It's about learning how to apply for it and all of the things that you have to do, um, which is life skills. And eventually that will get you where you want to be. And I think just, especially at the moment, doing loads of little online things, um so that's especially over this past year that's got me into quite a few things um and I've got a tiny little picture in a pictoplasma magazine which I can show you I've got right here. Um, but that is like the highlight of my art career yeah. because I have always admired them always wanted to get into it and um, there is Badly sewn boy. <laughs> I picked a plasma magazine that went all the way around the world. Um, and it's the little it's the little things like that um, that just sort of keep you going. And if, if you don't try things, you don't know what's gonna happen. So I think that's the, the big takeaway from all of it is if you don't go for it, if you don't ask the questions, you don't know the answers. So I think, yeah, just perseverance, resilience, and, and going for it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Karen, for being with us today. So You're welcome. It's been good fun. Bye. Bye.